now with Family Science of Fresno State. Uh, she has an extensive background in uh, the science of parenting, uh, parenting training, uh, sleep research for infants, and also, of course, looking at curiosity and the development of okay, curriculum in college students. And she's going to speak to us today. Okay. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mark. Uh, I, 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 you heard what my research is about. I'm a family scientist, but I've been teaching for, uh, this is my 20th year at Fresno State. And because I'm a scientist, I like to apply my, uh, my uh, research skills to my teaching. And, and I want to tell you something about that today, if I can. Uh, I did a research project back in 2017, and it didn't have anything to do with skepticism, or so I thought. I was studying the way child development students conceptualize their knowledge. So this is a method that's been used in other disciplines, and I wanted to see if it worked in, in my discipline. Do, do our students learn how to use deep conceptual categories? Uh, in my case, that would be the use of theory, as opposed to shallow conceptual categories. So, so this is what I was doing, but I was surveying graduating seniors. I hoped that they were they were developing the use of deep conceptual categories, and I wanted to compare them to our freshmen, our brand new students in an introductory child development class who'd never ever been in a class before. So I had my, my uh, experts and my novices, and uh, often researchers build in sort of double checks on your data, you know, just to make sure that, that everything's going the way I think. Uh, I added a question where I asked them to, to uh, self-rate their expertise. And I, I thought that the, the seniors would say that they're pretty expert, and the, and the freshmen would say uh, that, that I'm just a beginner. It's, it's, after all, it's the first day of class, you know? So this is the question I came up with, and, and maybe you can read the, the items and see how you'd rate yourself. Uh, I said, are you a novice? I don't know anything about it yet. It's all new to me. Uh, are you a beginner? I know a few things, but there's a lot I don't know. Intermediate, good foundational knowledge about some aspects of child development. Or do you have advanced knowledge, thorough foundational knowledge? Uh, when I wrote these items, by the way, uh, A is kind of what we think a freshman should be on the first day of school. B would be a sophomore, maybe. C is maybe a junior. Graduating seniors would be advanced. And then that definition of expert is what we think of someone with a master's degree. It's a pretty standard uh, conception of, of, of education. Uh, I expected my freshmen to say they were novices, and about 70% of them were kind of in the ballpark, right? But I just couldn't believe that 30% of people, it was literally the first week of class. <laughs> They had never had a child development class before, ever. And they thought they were intermediate or advanced. A couple even thought they were master's degree level, you know, and it was literally the first day of class. And I just couldn't believe it. I wondered, well, maybe they do have some expertise that, that is not captured by their <coughs> educational history. So I looked at things like their grades, and it doesn't necessarily tell me child development expertise, but, but they, they weren't necessarily any smarter. But please notice, they weren't any dumber either, you know? They were just sort of your ordinary students. Um, on that measure that I was originally looking at, the use of conceptual categories and kind of depth of understanding, uh, they were not very likely to use theory, but nobody was. They were no better than anybody else. Uh, this, this audience might be interested to know that I asked them about nine epistemically unwarranted beliefs that relate to child development. I'll show you what that list is in a minute. But out of that list of things, they were no less likely to believe nonsense. Uh, it looks like they might be a little more likely, but that wasn't statistically significant. So they really were not true experts. They were just false experts. This is what I call them, false experts. So I thought about it for a couple of years, you know, just what is that? Obviously, this is a good example of the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? Uh, this is the tendency of people with dem demonstrably low knowledge or skills to overestimate uh, their, their knowledge or skills. Um, Dunning and Kruger demonstrated this in multiple domains of knowledge. Uh, you all are probably very familiar with it. This is one of the graphs from the original paper where they asked people this was grammar, and, and you can see that uh, everybody kind of thought they would get about a 70% on the grammar test, 
And uh, so, so what you have there is, is people who did very, very badly on the grammar test at 15% or so, they way overestimated their abilities. But please notice that it's also complicated that people who did really well on the grammar test, 90%, slightly underestimated their, their uh, performance. So this is the kind of thing that, that led Dunning and Kruger to write about this, this effect, this overconfidence uh, among, among beginners. Uh, a later paper published by Sanchez and Dunning just last year uh, traced what happens to people when they're learning a new skill over time. And, and what they demonstrated is that actual competence uh, increases gradually, which probably doesn't surprise any of us. There are, there are no big leaps. You just sort of gradually accumulate knowledge and skill as you go. But confidence uh, it starts really low. If you haven't even tried it yet, you probably realize you don't know much about it. But, but they, they identified what they call the beginner's bubble. So, so you have one or two lessons, and you just think that you kind of got it all. So there's a big dramatic increase in confidence. And what they found happens over time is that it, it just steadies for a long time while they're accumulating information that maybe I don't know this as well as I think. And after a long time of confidence remaining steady, then it begins a, a modest and gradual increase, so it eventually coincides with their actual skill. So that's what they, they said happens with overconfidence. They did this, though, based on just pure averages. Uh, they didn't divide their sample into people who had this problem and people who didn't have this problem. And that was what I had noticed so dramatically in my students, is that some of them do this and some of them don't do this. By the way, they, they explain, their explanation for Dunning-Kruger is, is a purely cognitive explanation. They say it's a function of being unqualified to know how much you know or don't know. But, but they thought it was a purely cognitive thing, and I mention that because it'll be something I, I test. So I thought about it for a couple of years, trying to figure out why do only some people do this? I understand if it's a beginner's bubble that maybe everybody would do it, but why do only some do it but not others? And that was my research question. I, I, I came up with some possibilities. Dunning and Krieger had said it was cognitive. And I thought, well, maybe then the people who, who have this cognitive, uh, who exhibit this cognitive uh, kind of defect, let's say, uh, maybe they're low on intellectual humility. Maybe they, they really kind of think cognitively that I, I'm, I'm just smarter than everybody else and I can think better than everybody else. So maybe it is cognitive, but to be honest, I was a little skeptical of that. I thought it was probably gonna be more like narcissism. I thought it was gonna be a general personality trait rather than a, a cognitive thing. Um, and, and then I had one last possible explanation that I had to add to the list. Because I'm in child development, I hear this all the time, people, it seems to me, mistake their personal experience for professional expertise in my field. Everybody kind of was a child at some point. Um, most of us have had families. Many of us have been in a couple of families, and so people think child and family kind of got that covered. Right? So I thought maybe those are folks who just, they're around kids a lot, and that's why they think they're experts. Maybe it's that. So those are my hypotheses. Just this past uh, month, actually, uh, well, a month and a half ago, at the beginning of this semester, I surveyed every student in an introductory child development class in my department. Uh, all of the instructors agreed to do this. All of these surveys were done on either the first or the second day of class. And, and it was a slightly larger sample. Uh, did I get basically the same things? Uh, yes, you can see the number who, who categorized them as themselves as experts was 30% again. So it, it looks like this is a pretty stable number for my, for my group of students. Uh, once again, they're not, their GPAs are not any better or worse than anybody else's. Uh, their, their belief in epistemically unwarranted things is not any more or less than anybody else's. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's, we're looking at the same thing. That wasn't a fluke. I really do have about 30% of these false experts in my child development class. Uh, because these issues might interest you, I thought I'd show you the, the list of epistemically unwarranted beliefs. I've ranked them from uh, uh, most believed to least believed. Uh, most of, of people coming into child development think that eating sugar makes kids hyper. We know that it doesn't. 
Uh, we also know that frequently praising kids to raise their self-esteem doesn't actually help them learn anything and may actually be a detriment to them learning things. I study infancy and attachment, and so the next one hurts me a bit, <laughs> that people think that responding to a crying baby will make the baby cry more. The opposite is true. Uh, and children whose parents divorce are so damaged that they never recover, this is, this is uh, patently false. The vast majority of children uh, suffer emotionally uh, during a parental divorce, but there's no evidence of damage uh, for the vast, vast majority of kids, and for kids for whom there is some evidence of damage. By two years out, we can't tell the difference between a kid whose parents have divorced and kids whose parents have not. Uh, but, but the numbers start to get a little smaller. Some of the, the things lower on the list you're probably familiar with, the Mozart effect, satanic cults, uh, spanking makes kids more compliant, ouch, uh, to, to a family scientist, so that, that hurts, but it's only 23%. It's only and I do want to point out that five years ago when I asked the question about vaccines, 22% uh, of my students believed it, wow. um, and it's down to 7%, and I think that's due to the what we've been seeing in the media about, about anti-vax in the last couple of years, so yay for that, that's great. But, but, but that's what they're believing. Uh, so I told you I had the three hypotheses, right? Compre uh, intellectual humility, this is the measure that I used. Uh, it has several subscales. Uh, independence of intellect and ego. My students on a five-point scale, they're pretty good about this. They're almost a four. They're, they're not that worried about being personally attacked. Uh, they're pretty open to revising their viewpoint about things. They're about a four on a five-point scale. Uh, they also are very respectful of other people's viewpoints. The one they suffer a little bit on is intellectual overconfidence. They might have a little bit too much of that, but isn't that the very thing I'm studying, <laughs> right? The Dunning-Kruger, that's exactly what that is. So, so I gave them that measure. On the narcissism scale, uh, this is a measure that is used for general populations, not for clinical populations. So, so this is not de uh, uh, designed to measure people who are, uh, well, I might not mention the most famous narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he'd probably score off the charts. But this is sort of ordinary, everyday narcissism. And, and play along with me, if you will. I'm not going to show you all 16 items, but I'm going to show you a few. And, and the way it works is there are two statements, and the, and the person taking the test says which one fits them more. And I realize that maybe both fit you a little bit, but, but as, as we go along, see what your score would be, okay? Everybody likes to hear my stories, or sometimes I tell good stories. <laughs> I like to be the center of attention, or I prefer to blend in. I'm more capable than other people, or there's a lot I have to learn. I won't ask people to report their scores, but here's my guess. My guess is that one of those three, you said, well, I fall on the narcissism side. Yeah. And that's a pretty typical answer. When this was validated on college students, the average score was 35%, one out of three. And this is, we think of as healthy narcissism. There's nothing wrong with this, right? My students were even low on that. So first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that probably narcissism is not what's going to explain it for child development students. They're not particularly narcissistic. Um, the personal experiences with children, I just asked a bunch of questions about uh, their experiences. Are you a parent or a step-parent? Do you share your home with children? Do you have a paid job with children? Do you volunteer with children? Uh, my population at Fresno State is, uh, I'd say two-thirds is either Mexican immigrant or long immigrant. They come from very large families, and many of my students live with their younger siblings, or they live with nieces and nephews, and this is very typical. Two-thirds are sharing a home with the child. So maybe this is getting at why they feel like they have so much knowledge, uh, and half of them work with kids. Uh, you can see there that most of my students have some experience with kids. So here's the million dollar question. Do those relate to whether they're a false expert or not? Um, Intellectual humility, not at all. It's just simply not there. No relationship whatsoever. Narcissism, it's there, it's statistically significant, but that eta squared means 2% of the variability can be explained by narcissism. So not very much, and notice how low the score is. Even the false experts don't have a high score on narcissism. If 35% is kind of typical, even my, my false experts are pretty low on narcissism. So that's not going to be it. Experiences with kids, well, we're getting a little better, but 
7% of the variance is all we're explaining, even with their personal experiences. This is a pretty classic, disappointing experience for scientists, right? <laughs> <laughs> thought I was going to be able to tell you what it was, and then here I am, and then the answer is kind of, uh, it's still interesting, actually, isn't it? It's still interesting. I, I think, uh, um, think Dunning-Kruger effect is probably not a purely cognitive phenomenon. Um, maybe that's part of it, and my one instrument isn't, the, you know, isn't exhaustive in terms of cognitive stuff, but, but uh, no clue that it's, it's cognitive. I, I suspect it's probably not, and I also suspect it's probably not about narcissism. You know, maybe this, this image that I have of, of who these Dunning-Kruger folks are, um, it, I, I think it's probably wrong. The, the best explanation so far is that personal experiences are, are misinterpreted as, as imbuing automatically professional expertise. And, uh, and that's, that's probably not true, but even this is not a very compelling, uh, thorough explanation. Basically, you don't know why people, some people fall for this one and other people don't. And I just want to say that this has been echoed many times during this conference and prior conferences, prior PsyCon and TAM meetings. Uh, we kind of understand often, oops, Sorry, I had, a, had a, something I must have taken out and I forgot. But often we do understand the mechanisms behind cognitive biases. We understand why it happens. Uh, we've heard, heard talks about this at, at this conference quite a lot, but we just don't know why sometimes the mechanism is in play, and other times, among very similar people, the mechanism is not at play. I think fundamentally we still don't understand this. Uh, it leads me to a couple of questions that I, that I think I will keep pursuing. And, and the main one is, does that hurt anything that that 30% think they're already an expert before they even start the class? You know? Does that mean that since they think they're already, they already know it all, that they are somehow impaired from learning? Um, my ex my, my uh, experience in the classroom suggests that it will. Because, because I get students who resist things quite a lot, and, and their resistance will often be, uh, well, my kid gets hyper when she's had too much sugar, so there you go, right? Uh, and so that's, that's what it seems like to me, but I've been wrong before about what I, what I think is going on. So, so that might be the next question, is uh, what happens to these folks? And, and, uh, since I, I do have access to institutional data, I will be able to track their progress to find out kind of how they do in their degree program. And, uh, uh, so that's my first question. The second question is one that I'd be really curious if there are folks in the audience who, who have access to learner populations, if, if you'd kind of be interested in collaborating with me on this. I think that the 30% false expert to me, it feels like people fall for this because everybody was a child once and everybody had a family, right? And I just wonder if that's true in things like chemistry or other more uh, uh, disciplines where people are less likely to come in thinking that they have their own experience with that. Um, and, and I'm also interested in things like driving school. I have a 15-year-old right now who's in driving school and, and I've wondered, are 30% of those kids in driving school thinking they already have it down? You know, or is this... So, so, so how, does this compare? how does this compare across domains and, and across disciplines? And, and I'm really curious uh, about that. So that'll be the next thing I do. Thank you for your time. No. Testing. Oh, there we am. Thanks. Got it. <clears throat> Let me just get the next PowerPoint up. <clears throat> 